Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening uh, questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for U of I Extension, and I'm based here in central Illinois. And I love to answer questions about any type of flower, annuals, perennials, cut flowers. That's my favorite topic to chat about. But luckily, we have some other great experts on today who love to chat about other types of gardening topics. So, uh, Kelly, you want to introduce yourself and let them know what you like to talk about. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly Alsop, and I am based out of Bloomington. My expertise is integrated pest management, but I love to talk about pollinators and beneficial insects. And I've been really into trees lately, probably because of Ryan. <laughs> and I dabble in vegetable gardening during the summer. Excellent. And I'm Ryan Pancall, horticulture educator out of Champaign. And trees are addictive. So if you guys get into it, you <laughs> won't be able to not look at them once you start to get into the trees and ID and all that stuff. So that's my area of expertise, trees and woody plants. Um, I also do a lot with native plants. And I'm also a big vegetable gardener at home. So um, I have an interest in that. And with that, today we have a very special guest with us. Erin, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Erin Harper. I'm a local food systems and small farms educator uh, for Champaign, Ford, Iroquois, and Vermilion counties. Uh, I really focus in vegetable production or vegetable gardening. So growing your own vegetables at home is part of our food system. So that's one area that I focus on. Um, I also do a lot with food access, farm to school, school gardens, community gardens, um, and then our local specialty growers. So 
I'm excited today to talk about seed starting and start all of my own seeds, all of my March vegetables that need to be started. Um, I'm going to do that later today. So I'm pretty excited about that. Awesome. Thanks, Erin. So if you're new to the show, we do kind of pick a topic for the show every uh, every time. So like Erin said, our topic today is seed starting. So we're going to go in depth in that. So if you have questions about seed starting that you want to start adding into the comments, feel free. Or if you have any other gardening questions, we're happy to address those uh, today as well. Um, but I think we're going to kick it off by talking about uh, Kelly's showing us some things about figuring out if your seed is still viable and if it's if it's seed you still want to plant. So Kelly, take it away. Um, yes. So, um, you know, so we, we, we all collect these seed packages and then we don't know sometimes, uh, you know, how long the seed will last if we put, you know, because I put... Uh, extra seed in a refrigerator, but not a lot of gardeners do that or have access to that. And then sometimes seed is just hard to germinate and sometimes pre-sprouting is the way to go. So what I did is I gathered different kinds of seeds and I put them in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel and then I monitored when they actually germinated. So I wanted to show you a couple of my experiments. Um, the first one that germinated for me was radish. I knew this was going to happen. Radish is um, probably one of Aaron's favorites when it comes to teaching kids because it's a fast crop. Um, this one you usually sow seed directly in early spring. Um, this was two-year-old seed, and in three days, I had 100% germination. So this one did very well. I'm definitely going to use this seed this year. Um, and that's my determination from that. Then I did um, kohlrabi. This is also a direct um, seed crop in early spring. It was also 2019. Seed and within five days, I had a hundred percent germination. Awesome, nice, pretty good. I did Swiss chard now. Swiss chard is um, uh, actually it's in a, essentially it's a beet, and the seed is actually a dried berry. And in the past, I personally have had some issues with germination of beets. So, um, and then, um, so I, you know, read that sometimes people pre-soak their beet seeds in water for 24 or 48 hours, and then they try to get the seeds to germinate, or sometimes growers or gardeners will even um, pre-sprout them within the paper towel and then plant them like that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, you know, see if pre-soaking or not soaking made a difference within Swiss chard, and it did not. Mm -hmm. um, even though I soaked it for three days, within seven days, I had 100% germination of the pre-soak. The non-soak, within five days, I had 100% germination. So you don't have to soak your... Swiss chard seed, especially this one in particular. But if you ever have issues with beets, this may be your issue. And maybe Erin can give us a little bit more on why Kelly has had issues with germinating beet seeds in the past. My next one was spinach. Again, this one did awesome. Um, it was 2019 seed. Within 10 days, I had 92% germination. Again, a seed I would definitely use, 92% is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, the last one was um, a, a flower seed. It was osteospermum. I just wanted you to see that this is what osteospermum looks like. Clearly, this is a white variety. This one is usually, the seed is usually started indoors and then planted as transplants into the garden. Um, most gardeners buy osteospermum as transplants. Mm -hmm. Now this seed was is four years old, so I actually expected lower germination. 
Within 10 days, I had about 40% germination and I kept going for another 20 days and I never got any more to germinate. So um, this was a 40% germination overall. Would this be seed a gardener would use? Absolutely. Would this be seed that I would use in a greenhouse? No way. That 40% is not good enough for me. I wouldn't want to waste my, um, my time with it. I would actually order newer seed and hopefully have a larger germination rate. So sometimes people see, you know, I, I just, the reason I wanted to show this is because sometimes you see things and then you're waiting and waiting and waiting for it to germinate or you're like, how long does it take? So really just some of these cool season crops, which I knew were going to be easy to germinate, germinated really fast. But even a, a longer crop, a longer seed that I thought a new osteospermum was going to take longer. Within 10 days, I had my full germination that I was going to have in the long run. So, um, you know, I, I think even though some seed does take three to four weeks of germination, most of the time it's not going to take that long. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if Ryan or Aaron or Candace want to comment on the experiment, they can, or and that's what I have. Well, that's that's pretty interesting. And I like most of you guys probably, I have a whole box of old seed. And I just, you know, I can't stand to throw it away, not because I'm necessarily always going to use that seed, but it's like when I want to look back to like what kind of spinach did we plant in 2018, I can, you know, pull it out and it kind of helps me pick seed for this year. But Gosh, I, it's kind of encouraging to see a couple year old seed really sprout. I mean, I'm always just so reluctant to use that old seed because I, you put so much time into getting the garden ready and planting and everything and to have it not come up is such a disappointment that, yeah. uh, but maybe, you know, I usually advise folks just to get new seeds, but I mean, this is pretty good evidence that some old seed can be, can still sprout pretty well. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. In order to not just throw the seed away. We usually just um, put twice as much or three times as much of the seed that you would normally expect in that space. So if you're planting outside and it the packet says, you know, one seed every inch, but that seed is four years old, just, you know, sprinkle it in as close mm -hmm. as you can, because then if you only have 40% germination, then your plants are going to be spaced out about what the packet said in the beginning. So instead of just throwing away the whole thing, you just use more seed than you normally would. Same with starting your seeds inside. Normally you put one seed in each cell or each little container. If your seed is two to five years old, you want to increase that with each year. So as your seed gets older, your percentage of germination is going to go down. So if it's seed from last year, maybe put two seeds in each container. If it's two years old, um, you know, increase that again, put four seeds. If it's even older, put eight seeds. And then if more than one germinate, you can kind of wiggle those out really gently right after they sprout and either get rid of them or put them in their own container at that point. But that way you're at least getting what you can out of them and not just discarding all of them. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent tip, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Super good. Okay, we had yeah. at least one question come in here. Um, question, is it best to germinate before you put in the soil? Um, and then also, does it matter where you purchase your seeds from? So you want to comment on that? In most cases, I would say it. you don't have to germinate completely free of soil before you plant them. Um, that can be pretty difficult for, um, I, if you aren't like a plant planting expert, that seems, I wouldn't even, I would not do that. Like that seems like a really difficult task, but some sometimes you will um, germinate your seed sort of in a larger like open container, like, you know, put all of your seeds in there and then as they germinate and they start growing, at least they're growing in the correct directions. If you germinate it on a flat surface, it's just going to kind of be growing crazy. So if you germinate it in some soil and then once it starts to come up, 
Um, you use like the end of a pencil to loosen the soil around it. You pull that out and then put it in a larger container. That's totally fine. But I personally wouldn't try to wreck it or I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to germinate it on the paper towel for actually using. That's just to test your germination mm -hmm. rate. Yeah. So you just kind of toss those afterwards, right, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Just to, you weren't going to plant those. Yeah, I, I did toss them afterwards, but I'm glad she uh, explained the pre-sprouting thing because um, that cleared it up for me a little bit. Uh, maybe, you know, with the beets, I should try to pre-sprout them in that contain that larger container of mm -hmm. soil and then try to plant the individual small seedlings. I just, I, I don't always, I mean, I love beets, Aaron. They're my almost my favorite vegetable. I love the greens. I love eating beets. I just, uh, sometimes I just have some germination issues. Yeah, so I will address that in one moment. I <laughs> remembered that there was a second part to our Facebook oh, yeah. question. Yeah. Um, does yep. it matter where to buy your seeds? Yep. And I would say no, if it is a certified retailer, um, if you're purchasing seeds from a store, um, then, you know, they there is a regulatory system for seeds and they should say on the packet what the germination rate was. So it's required that um, seed companies test, do that germination test that Kelly just showed you. They have to actually do that each year um, with each, like a certain number of packet of seeds. They have to do that again package the seeds and print the germination rate on that seed packet. So the back of your seed packet should say 95% germination, 90% germination. Um, and there's different requirements for different types of seeds. So um, if you're purchasing from a store, the, um, the company should not really have an impact on the performance of the seeds. Um, that would be my general answer. Very good, awesome. Okay. An excellent, excellent question. Keep those questions coming in the chat box, the comment box if you have them. Um, but yeah, while we're waiting, let's let's get into the beats. Give us some yeah. suggestions on what to do. Uh, so especially if you're growing your beets outside, so you're planting them outside, which is what we would typically do. Most of your root vegetables, you just plant directly into the garden. Uh, but when seeds are germinating, they like to have a higher temperature than the temperature that the plant likes to grow at. So when you start your seeds inside, you can give them a light that's really close by. It is warm in your house or um, in a greenhouse where we would start seeds commercially. And you usually also use a seed mat so that when the seed is germinating, it's at 78 to 86 degrees. If you plant those seeds outside, like next week, it's not 86 degrees. Your soil's not 86 degrees. So that's why you have the lower germination rate. So you can, if you're really into beets and you love them so much and you want to make sure that you get them, you can start them inside and you just grow them in um, a transplant container for like two to three weeks, you know, just let them get their first real leaves and then plant them outside. Um, and then your other option would be really using like a black plastic over the top of your soil to warm it up. So um, if it's sunny and you have plastic over the top, that's going to warm up your soil. So you could plant your seeds, put a greenhouse plastic or a black plastic over the top and wait for those seeds to germinate. But then you have to remove it as soon as those seeds, you know, start growing um, germinate and the plant starts growing above the ground because at that point it's going to need sunlight. Mm -hmm. So if you're using the clear plastic, you could leave that, create a little high tunnel. So they just really need to be warmer while they're trying to germinate and get going, but then they really like the cool temperatures. So it's, you just got to get them going first and then they'll be great. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever tried any of that, Kelly? This would be no. Fun. Nice. Well, and I know you tend to grow a lot of your vegetables in containers too. I do. Yeah. Mm. Which kind of plays into that. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. If you're growing in a container, this brings up an excellent thing. <laughs> um, bring the whole container inside where it's warmer and the seeds can be warmer to germinate. So you can plant your beets 
in your container inside, get them growing a little bit, and then put them outside. At that point, you would need to harden them off a little bit. Um, so if you start them inside, then put them outside during the day for a few hours, bring them back in at night, and slowly leave them out longer and longer. So that's called hardening off. And you need to do that with all of your uh, vegetable starts or even house plants that you have brought in for the winter, reintroducing those to the outside, you need to do that slowly. So, um, but yeah, for starting those beets, bring the whole container inside, get them started and growing and then put it outside. Brilliant. Yeah, that's it's easy. <laughs> yeah. You solved my bee problem. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds easy. Yeah, you'll right. have to let us know how that goes. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay, we've had some questions come in, so I'm going to um, hop over to YouTube. We've got a couple over there. Um, Allie asks, we're going to try bringing Cardoon into our annual designs this summer, but none of our team has started it from seed. Any insights or experience there? Cardoon, anybody? No, no experience there. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly's gonna look. Kelly's gonna look, look it up. It up. <laughs> I know. Maybe yeah, I love Cardoon, but yeah, I certainly have never started it myself. But it's a cool plan. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll give Kelly a second to look that up, and let's go to the next one. Um, David asks: Is it necessary? Um, should you cover your seed with a dark cloth until they sprout? So basically blocking out sunlight until they sprout. Is that needed? Does it depend on the seed? Um, some seeds, not very many, but there are a few seeds that actually need a little bit of sunlight to germinate. Uh, most seeds don't need sunlight, um, but I don't think it's necessary to block the sun from them. If they get hit by the sun, it's not going to impede their germination. Mm -hmm. um, most seeds do want full contact with the soil though. So um, yeah. Yeah. I think those seeds want to be covered by soil. Yeah. Um, but I think it would worry me j just knowing me that I'd forget to pull that, that black piece of cloth or whatever off in time and would ha have more damage than I caused any soil warming or benefit you get from it. So it would, it would worry me to have that out there, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest tip is to just really re check that seed packet. It's going to tell you like how deep that seed needs to be planted and if it needs to be covered with soil, if it doesn't. I um, started a lot of, a couple of my seeds this past weekend and a lot of the things I was starting um, were ones that light actually aided the germination a little bit. So the seed packet would tell me that and it would say to just basically place your seeds and not cover them um, with soil. So usually the seed packet's going to give you that inside most of the time, mm -hmm. which is helpful. Okay, I think we've got a couple others. Let me see here. Kelly, did you find anything out? Um, I didn't find anything in the book, but I found something on... Um, through Oregon where you, I mean, it doesn't give me, you know, seed germination requirements. It just says that um, <clears throat> sometimes people direct seed into the field, but they have to do that in May because cardoon is not a cool season crop. Yeah. It's sensitive to frost. And then, um, most of the time people do them as transplants. So they're uh, seeding them indoors and that's about like the standard six to eight weeks before um, you're ready to transplant them. So that's what I'm finding right now. Yeah, and I would say too, check with your seed source. Um, like I said, the seed packet or most, a lot of times they're gonna give you that info too, which might be helpful. Okay, cool. We've got a plethora of other questions. Let's see. Um, Eileen asks, how do you know when to start germination inside? I know the back of the packet has some information. Mm -hmm. Any other tips on that? Yeah, I would say first step is to decide when you want to plant it outside. And then, yeah, count backwards. The seed packet should say, um, I was actually just making a slide on this for something I'm doing on Saturday, but um, so here in central Illinois, um, our last frost date is May 15th. That's
that's the last frost. That doesn't necessarily mean all of the plants want to grow outside that day. So I usually look at that day and then kind of decide when I'm going to plant my plants outside. So for something like tomatoes, they don't like overnight temperatures below 45. So last frost, you need to wait another like month before you plant. So then I say, I'm going to plant tomatoes on May 15th. And the seed packet says to start transplants six to eight weeks before. So then I count back from there and I know um, the date that I need to start my seeds. So it's a bit of a calculation and um, I actually use an Excel sheet to figure that out for me. I just enter the info and it gives me the date. Um, so yeah, decide what day you wanna plant outside and then count backwards from there based on the info on the seed packet. Perfect. And if the packet doesn't tell you um, for some reason, you could certainly search on our website and maybe we'll get a link in there. We have a really great infographic that gives you some of that information about, and I think Kelly has a blog post on it too, that we can get yeah. um, linked and, as well. Um, I, I'm sure Aaron and Ryan can attest to this, that this vegetable gardening mm -hmm. book in the Midwest, if you grow any types of vegetables, not Cardoon, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this is such a good book, Aaron. I love it so much. It has yep. really helped me. I've got mine right here. <laughs> yeah, mine's on my bookshelf right over here. <laughs> um, so when I'm going to, when I plan out what I want to grow, um, I use this book and I, I, to, I take exactly what directions it gives me. Now, of course, it was, um, you know, of course, it'll say seed in spring, right? So that um, infographic is a little bit better, but this is a really good book to get if you um, are a vegetable gardener in Illinois. Yeah, it's got some general information at the start about seed starting, other things, I'll, like goes through a lot of this discussion we've already had today, but then I like how it has you know, specific section on each vegetable crop, major crops, minor crops, herbs, um, and then gives varieties. I think that's what the this most recent update, maybe it was 2017, they updated this, um, has like new and updated varieties where, you know, long before I worked for Extension, when I was a vegetable gardener, this was the resource I used. It was a version or two ago, uh, but, you know, just a great, just general resource for vegetable gardening. It's really where I direct a lot of folks for like Illinois specific information mm -hmm. and it's all there kind of in one text. Um, yeah. So Perfect. great resource. Yeah. And we'll see if we can get a link to that. Um, otherwise most of our extension offices sell that publication too. So you can always reach out to your local extension office and see if you can grab it. Cause it's definitely helpful. Okay. Let's see what else we've got here. Sharon's got a question. Um, I live in Kentucky and I'm assisting my son's family in Illinois. I have started tomato and pepper seeds. When do I bring the transplants to put in their raised beds? So it sounds like if she's got those transplants going, when would she put those tomato and pepper transplants in an Illinois raised bed? What would you say? Yeah, for central Illinois, uh, my farming plant outside day is May 5th, but with that, you need to be prepared for some cold, potentially cold weather and having some uh, row cover or sheets or something ready to cover those up. Uh, last year, we had a hard frost at the end of May, which was pretty late for us, but things like that can happen. So I would say earliest plant outside day for tomatoes and peppers um, is May 5th, but personally for my garden at home, um, I will wait until at least one more week. And at that point, I'll check the weather, look at the 10-day forecast and see if it's even a good idea at that point. So uh, mid-May is my general and yeah, So that's, that's for central Illinois and, you know, adjust it within a week or two, north mm -hmm. or south. If you're and, and so I've vegetable garden for many years in southern Illinois. And so I'm usually like Aaron here in central Illinois, right around the start of May is when I'm trying to get my tomato plants out. But it just feels so late compared to southern Illinois, where it was, you know, back in April. And I had just a, a gardening buddy that he, he always had a greenhouse and the biggest tomato plants going. It was always a competition to, like, get the first tomato. So I'm used to always trying to. And I guess for me, like, I, I don't feel too bad sometimes if I lose 
a tomato plant or something to frost, I just go get another seedling. And actually that late frost last year got about half my uh, sun gold tomatoes because I just, I didn't get everything covered and they were the ones that I let sit out. And so it usually you're lucky enough still at the end of May to be able to score some seedlings at a garden center and replace stuff. But I'm always the kind of person that likes to get those out a little early and kind of get them going and try and get a tomato as soon as possible. So it kind of depends on your outlook too. I know a lot of folks yeah. around here, you know, are more towards the end of May before they're putting tomatoes out. So it just yeah. depends on the risk you're willing to accept. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Aaron, I, um, I've actually had some issues with pepper plants in the past of planting them too early and so I, I, I asked a grower once what the secret was to peppers, and he said, never plant before June 1st, hmm. because they do not like any cool temperatures. Right. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, they really don't, tomatoes and peppers alike, they really don't like overnight temperatures um, around any lower than 45. So it really depends on the year. Um, two years ago, it was 80 degrees by the end of May, um, or maybe it was three years ago, but you know, the point is some years it's really warm and our overnight temperatures are in the fifties, plant mid-May. Last year, it was cool all year. So even when we planted in June, the plant sat there for three weeks and did not grow at all because it was just still too cool and they don't like that cool weather. Um, it was almost July before we really start started to see all of our field crops, um, our tomatoes and peppers in the field start growing. Um, the ones in the greenhouse that had a little bit extra heat um, from the plastic cover, they did great. They were fine. Uh, but those field stuff, anytime, if it's, if it's not warm, um, they aren't going to grow. So just like we were talking about with Kelly's beets and uh, kind of creating a little bit of a warmer space. You can use a greenhouse plastic um, so you could get a tomato cage for your peppers as well um, and wrap that in greenhouse plastic and put some over the top of it and you create your own little individual greenhouse for that one plant mm -hmm. um, and that can really help your plants grow faster um, or if you plant them earlier it's going to help them uh, be a little bit warmer overnight. So that's one solution to that problem. Yeah, that's a cool idea. I like that. Have you ever yeah. used those water walls? Do you know what I'm talking about, Aaron? Oh, the like, yes, I know what you're talking about. Um, so like, like bubble like, wrap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have not ever used those. Um, and I would think as soon as the sun goes down, like it's not, it might hold heat a little bit longer than just the air inside, which is sort of the point. The idea is that the sun warms up the water throughout the day. When the sun goes down, the water releases some of that heat slowly so that it keeps the plant a little bit warmer through the night than it normally would be. Um, I, I personally don't have experience with those and I haven't read reviews or um, seen any studies done with them. So I'm not sure how much longer they provide heat than just using a, a regular plastic. Um, I would imagine it gives you at least an hour worth of benefit, but. Um, so what exactly are these things? I'm not familiar with what you guys are talking about. <laughs> it's like a plastic, double walled plastic thing, kind of looks like bubble wrap, but the air bigger. pockets are filled with water. Um, and they are made to go around your plants. Wow. Yeah. So you can have a picture. I'll look for one. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Always new things. You might have to try it out, Ryan. See how it does. I might Let have us to try that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome questions. We had a couple more here. Um, question. This one was earlier. Um, you mentioned black plastic as a covering, but I thought it needed to be clear plastic for light purposes. So you were just talking about that black plastic before the seeds germinate, right? To, yeah. to just warm up the ground essentially. Yep. Um, so on the farm, we use black plastic and we'll put that down weeks before we want to plant in it. And that helps warm up the soil. So yeah, if you don't have a clear plastic or can't find it, because it's honestly easier to find the rolls of black plastic, 
Um, you can put that down and the sun hitting that will help warm up your soil. And then you can either plant your seeds, check how many days it takes those to germinate and then uncover them or just uncover them at that point. If like what Ryan mentioned, he's afraid he would forget about it and then the seeds are going to germinate, not have sunlight. Uh, but you can use that plastic before you plant anything to really get that soil warmed up. Cool. Good tip. Okay, question here from Rosemary. How would you germinate seed for sprouts? Any tips on sprouts? Uh, the same, pretty much the same as any other plant. Oh, yeah, there's one. There you go. Sorry, sorry. Oh. I have to hit stop and then I... <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. So here's the water wall we were talking about. Do you guys see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's more okay. a gardener thing than yeah. a, a farmer thing, which is why mm -hmm. Katie probably wouldn't use it because it would be a lot of expense for a, a farmer. Yeah, definitely yeah. a small scale use. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Kelly. <laughs> um, so yeah, growing sprouts, I would use the like a four by four container is what I use my grow my sprouts in. Um, I have a greenhouse type container, but you could easily use a plastic sandwich container or something like that. Um, but you always want the seeds to just be covered with a little bit of really fine soil um, and then keeping them damp. Um, when seeds are germinating, they want to be warm, as we've talked about, but they also want to stay consistently wet. Um, so not sopping wet, but just um, that sort of, they sell like seed germination domes and that's to keep all of that moisture in so that they stay damp consistently. Um, if you don't have one of those, just spraying with a little water bottle um, multiple times a day, every few hours to make sure that it stays wet at all times. If the seeds kind of start to wake up and then they dry out, you're kind of moving backwards. Mm -hmm. So that can make germination either take longer or not happen at all. So you need to keep them consistently moist. Okay, good tip. Yeah, I've definitely seen people they'll sterilize and clean like a rotisserie chicken container or a clamshell from the fruit, yeah. like any of those kind of reuse material kind of things. Yeah, leftovers. Yeah. That's what this is for. Perfect. <laughs> and then the lid is clear so you can see when they start growing, but it helps hold in the moisture so you don't have to keep watering it or spraying it every few hours. Perfect. Yeah, create your own little mini greenhouse, basically. I used yeah. to have a fancy sprout kit that I bought from the, you know, in a in a, in a garden center, and I, I sprouted seeds all, sprouted all the time because it was, I, I was a sprouts on my sandwich nut. <laughs> uh, and then when I came to extension, my nutrition educator was be very careful teaching about sprouts. Um, Good safety. <laughs> when I would, you know, because I, in the sprout seeds, they always tell you the direction. So you always, it, I always like soaked them for 24 hours. And then when I soaked them, I put a little bit of bleach into the oh. soak water. And that was a way for me not to have those potential, what, what is it? Uh, uh, my Salmonella. Salmonella. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, you know, so she just wanted me to make sure to let people know that when you're, when you're sprouting, there is a potential for salmonella and that when I soaked my seeds with a little bleach, that kind of helped me prevent that. Mm -hmm. Smart. Yeah, so anytime you're growing sprouts, um, you know, rinsing them, if you're growing it like in a jar with a sprouting lid, um, I don't have that up here. It's down in my kitchen, sorry. Uh, but you use like a screen. Oh, I've actually used another tool I have up here right now. Um, so I have this here to show you about, um, it's just a fine mesh sieve from my kitchen. Um, but I use this sometimes for sprouts. Once you have soaked them for 24 hours, they expand. They're usually large enough not to fall through here. So you can use this to dump them in, put it back in your container, or use this and even rinse them. Uh, but you need to do that multiple times to yeah, make sure that they aren't growing bad bacteria because they are staying wet. So you're kind of creating a good environment for that. And then once they're done sort of growing, spread them out so they can dry out. 
um, before you store them in the refrigerator. So yeah, you do need to make sure you're being safe with those. But I also use this, um, not this particular one, because this is actually one for my kitchen. Um, but when you are starting seeds and you want to cover them with really fine soil, if you you have regular potting soil, you're filling your containers with, and you put your seeds on top, you want to put, you want to kind of sift the soil and just get the finest particles to sprinkle on top. So there's nothing really big in the way when those seeds just start growing, you know, they're just tiny little tender baby plants. Um, they don't have the power necessarily to move the soil out of the way. So you want to kind of push it through here, finest particles, sprinkle them on top um, for your seed starting. That's a great so, idea. Multi-use tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of that. That's good. Okay, I'm going to hop over to YouTube. We've got a couple questions there. Um, Josh was wondering if any of us have any experience using biostimulants during germination, and if so, any opinions or recommendations? Biostimulants. Anybody got anything? I've used them in tree care, but not ever in uh, veggie gardening, so not sure. Well, and what's, what's the premise... Do you want to share what's the premise behind using them in tree care? Like what is what is their ideal use? I guess I should ask. Sure. So it, I mean, in terms of tree care, um, you know, a lot of times we're looking you're looking to remediate the soil. So in an urban setting, you know, so many times soil is compacted, it's been dug up and mixed around during home construction or some kind of construction, that you just have poor quality soils. And so um, you know, trees really benefit for some improvement in that soil in one way or another. And really improving soil structure, drainage, air exchange, all those kind of things are the biggest improvement, but there's a whole line of these products where you can either add biostimulants to um, stimulate the microbial populations that are there. It's essentially a food source for soil microbes that naturally cycle nutrients It boosts their population. It gives them a lot of carbon, a lot of energy. Um, and in terms of tree care, another really important thing we can add is mycorrhizal fungi. So they, you know, there's, there's a specific relationship with them and tree roots and plant roots where they help with uh, nutrient water uptake for the plant that's infected in the roots. And so where I've used it in tree care is in such situations where, again, we're trying to remediate that soil um, it's not an immediate fix. You know, it's, these are um, off, often liquid applied products that you can dissolve in liquid and inject into the soil, um, or you can mix it into backfill when you're planting trees is kind of the different ways that you can apply it. Um, mm -hmm. But I always viewed it as, we always used it in, in kind of like a complete, you know, soil remediation plan. So we're not going to just add those biostimulants and fungi because the soil conditions that are present there were not good to support them in the first place. So if we don't do something to change that a little bit, it, this one-time boost doesn't really matter that much. Where mm -hmm. if you can do some other things to improve that soil environment, and um, you know, a lot of times that's just adding mulch, that's reducing co competition with turf and other non-native, like super competitive plants that are there in the tree's root zone, um, and you can improve those soil conditions a little bit, then it's almost viewed as kind of with mycorrhizae, a one-time inoculation of that soil environment where then the, you know, you've created conditions that are a little more conducive to mycorrhizae sticking around. And so um, it's just kind of a one-time boost of everything where I think that some of the misconception with that and Candace, we kind of talked about this over email. Yeah. We just had a question on here. Um, I think the misconception a lot of times is that um, it's they're getting applied every year consistently all the time. And in my opinion and in my experience, if you're not doing something else to improve soil conditions, um, you're not going to get those microbial populations sticking, sticking around and boosted. So, you know, beyond mulching, one of the things we do a lot and I've probably talked about on this show is vertical mulching, where you actually auger out little holes with a bulb auger and then backfill with amended soil and you base, you know, about every three feet foot on center or even closer underneath the uh, drip line of that canopy of that tree. And that improves that soil structure and all those little spots where you drill a hole, you know, you've loosened, you've aerated, you've added back like good quality soil with a higher organic matter content. And just over the course of a whole root system, you know, on uh, holes here and there, um, boost the, you know, the functioning of all that soil and the tree's roots and that whole ecosystem there. So, hmm. so that's kind of how it's used in, in tree care. I would guess in, 
I don't know, in terms of vegetable production, it's probably also just kind of this energy source for microbial populations we're adding to a soil medium or soil. I guess probably needs to yeah. be in real soil to really yeah. have a whole lot of microbial activity. But mm -hmm. Ryan, it looks like it's a fairly new research um, initiative. It looks like Cornell is doing some stuff on crop seeds, but I don't think there's, um, you know, I, I, I could look further, but I have I didn't see anything really on biostimulants with vegetable seeds. So that's probably why mm -hmm. the four of us are like, huh? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's a really yeah. cool concept though, because you know, soils come in come with this built-in, you know, nutrient cycling population of microbes. And whatever we can do to promote that, we're getting that for free, you know, out of it. We're, you know, in a lot of cases in agriculture, we're adding nutrients directly with, you know, a big carbon footprint for those inputs where this is like nature's way of making nutrients plant available on, on its own. So kind of cool. Hmm. Interesting. It kind of feels like cover crops could be a biostimulant in essence. Right, Ryan or Aaron? Uh, in a way. I mean, they, they add yeah, organic yeah. matter. Yeah, they add organic matter, but um, in the microbial community research that I've read, it it more and more looks like each plant has its own host of um, microbial community members. <laughs> um, and so, you know, even if we're talking of a cover crop, which has lots of benefits, adds organic matter creates cover, holds onto the soil through the winter, can fix nitrogen, you know, all of these great things. The microbial community for the cover crop is not necessarily the same microbial community that a tomato plant needs. It might have some of the same ones and having a soil in general that can support a healthy microbial community, that's the key. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is still really emerging. Um, there has been handfuls of research done on it and it's really picking up steam. So there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, in terms of germination, I don't think that the microbial community necessarily has a huge influence because for germination, it's really about water, temperature, having that connectivity to yeah. the soil in general, just like touching you know, feeling like it's in a little blanket in the soil. Um, and then it, the seed has every, all of the nutrients it needs inside to get going. So in terms of germination, that's really um, the environment you're creating temperature water wise. But then once it starts growing, yes, different plants want different nutrients as well as now. Now we know more about their microbial communities, but um, not a lot of proven products for adding that to your vegetable plants. So um, that's, that's a really interesting point though, Erin. And I think a lot of folks kind of forget about this, that that seed has built in energy reserves and it's, it's mm -hmm. built to, you know, sprout that little plant. But um, in you all's experience, I don't know the answer to this. At what point is it that that little emerging seedling is starting to have a nutrient demand that we need to think about and worry about? Um, it probably differs for each plant, but, um, I think sort of like growing our sprouts, if you sprout your seed, not in soil, and you're just rinsing it with water each day, you know, it'll keep growing for about 10 days usually before they kind of start to pitter out. So, um, at least for our common sprouting, uh, for eat, consuming as sprouts, vegetables, it seems to be about 10 days, but I don't have a list of research that says, and I'm, again, I'm sure it's different for each seed every year, the conditions that that seed was grown and harvested in, uh, but probably, you know, you have a few days before it runs out of its own reserves. And I guess in a lot of cases, probably your potting mix, mm -hmm. you know, is, is going to have nutrients added mm -hmm. that are going to carry it through for a while, but yeah. I always just kind of wonder about that because I'm not really fertilizing my seedlings as they're getting going. And I always wonder if, you know, there's maybe something sooner I should be doing. But yeah, I have I mean, a standard rule of thumb in the greenhouse. I, I know I'm not talking 
you know, like Katie's vegetables. But when I was in the greenhouse, when my seed, I would, you know, get my seed to germinate. Of course, I had ideal conditions. And then once it germinated, I would count two or three weeks. And that's mm-hmm. when I would fertilize those new plants. I never yeah. did ever did it before that. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's good timing. If your your potting soil, like Ryan said, is going to have some nutrients in it, mm-hmm. um, and you can over fertilize and burn your plants, um, so you want to be careful there and not give a little baby seedling too much fertilizer. It's going to be like, what do I do with all of this? And it's just going to kind of freak out. So yeah, you want to give it a few weeks. Um, make sure it has some real leaves. So our first two leaves that come out on a plant aren't its real leaves. So you want to wait until the next set appears. Um, And then at that point, the plant is really trying to do some stuff. So at that point, you could add the fertilizer. And yeah, a, a good rule of thumb, like Kelly said, is like three, about three weeks, probably after you start see that to see that plant grow. Excellent. Okay, let me see. We've got one other one over here on YouTube, and this is a good segue. Uh, Do you have a recommendation on peat pots versus plastic pots for starting seeds? And I know, Erin, you had a couple of show and tell things. Do you want to maybe talk about types of containers uh, quick? Sure. Um, Yeah, I use uh, here at home, I use my paper compressed egg cartons. Um, these aren't quite large enough for a eight week old tomato plant. That's not going to be happy in here, but this is really good for getting everything going. Tomatoes and peppers, I will move into slightly larger containers, but for lettuces, um, scallions, most of my flowers, pretty much everything is going to start in here and it'll stay in here. Um, this kind of maximizes on space because it's a lot smaller. Um, For everything at our farm situation, uh, we use plastic because we can sanitize it. We can reuse it multiple times. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is what works best for us. Uh, Peat pots are expensive, but, um, and maybe not great for the environment. We've talked about that a few times. Um, I'm sure it's come up on Facebook Live before, but peat is something that is harvested, so it is not renewable. Um, I have seen coconut core pots now available. So that would be my recommendation if you don't want to use plastic is to use something made with coconut core. Um, But your cucurbit plants, so cucumbers, pumpkins, squashes, um, those plants don't like to have their roots messed with. So you do want to start those in paper, something that's going to biodegrade. So you can just plant the whole thing. You don't want to start those in plastic where you're then like removing the plant from the plastic and, you know, breaking it up a little bit before you put it in the ground. If you do that with your cucumber plants, they're not going to be happy. Um, They might not survive, but at the very least, it's really going to stunt their growth. Um, So, yeah, again, personally, I use the paper. Um, You can also use the top part of the egg carton. Um, to start, you know, like we said, with just germinating a bunch of seeds in one space and then moving them. So you could use the top for that um, and then plastic for anything else. Um, The rest of my setup back here to continue on, I have some plastic pieces. So I have this shallow uh, one inch uh, tray and this one has holes in it, as you can see. Um, So this allows everything to drain. So I can put my, well, let's see how it fits. I'm going to put my egg cartons on here. Water, excess water is going to drain through. But up here in my office with my wood floor, I don't want that to necessarily happen. So I have a larger two-inch deep tray that does not have holes in it that I sit underneath. So this allows the water to drip excess water to drip through to the bottom uh, without getting all over my floor. Um, I also take this into the bathroom to water and then we'll bring it back uh, to make sure I don't splash anything on the wall. 
and I'm not missing those edge plants out of fear for dripping on the ground. A lot of people just kind of hit stuff in the middle Mm -hmm. and then your edge plants dry out. So I take it in the bathroom, water it, bring it back in, put it back under my lights in a different orientation than what I took it out. So different plants are getting different light at different times. So that went a little beyond the question, but that's (laughs) a little (laughs) setup. That's perfect. Excellent. Yeah, that's very similar to what I have going on in my garage too. Just a metal, a metal system with some lights and plastic trays and getting everything going, which leads me to a good next question to chat about from Lynn. Um, can you speak a little bit about grow lights for starting indoors? Um, she says she has two different brands. Um, one has a strange colored shield that has red and blue colored sections. I had some tomato plants I started that turned purple last year and were stunted after starting. I wonder if it may have been this starting light that did it. What do you think? Um, well, for the first part, um, I think the T5 uh, lights are what is most commonly recommended now. Um, so the one that I have here and in my other office are T5s. Um, But at the farm, we actually don't have supplemental lighting, but it is in a greenhouse. So it's a little bit longer exposure than it would be in your window in your house. Um, So I do recommend T5 lights. They, you can get them in several different brands, lots of different stores. Um, It's just the the grade of light. Um, The, the red and blue lights is a very traditional thing. I have another I have a red and blue, like three armed light that I have for my house plants for the winter. Um, it actually just stopped working last week. So I was like, well, I guess good timing. The <laughs> sun is out a little longer. I'm not going to yeah. replace it yet. Um, but the red and blue lights was a very traditional thinking of that those were the most important lights for plants. Um, but Now research more shows that plants really do need that full light spectrum. So it was thought because plants are green, that means they reflect green. So they appear green to us. Mm -hmm. So there was some thought that they didn't need green light. They're reflecting all of it. They don't take any of that in. But research has showed that that's not the case. So plants actually do need the full spectrum of light. So a regular fluorescent or these T5 grow lights Um, is going to give you healthier plants than just a red-blue light. Red-blue is still great. It's still supplemental. Um, As long as those plants aren't like in a closet and that's its only light. If it's getting some sunlight, it's getting light from regular overhead lights in your house, and you're supplementing with a red-blue light, then they're going to be just fine. Um, The other part of that question, um, the stunted plant... Mm -hmm. Sounds more like a nutrient deficiency to me than that the lights turned it purple. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't think it was the lighting in that case. But like I said, if with just that red blue light, you want to make sure that it is getting some outside sunlight as well, if you can. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, either a nutrient problem or maybe even a cold. They put it out too early and there's some cold problems too. Yeah. Awesome. Good question. Uh, we got about five minutes left. And I think we're down to one question. So we'll see where we're at. Um, Nina asked, should there be drainage holes at the bottom of the takeaway containers? I think she's talking back to the sprouts. Um, should there be drainage holes? And do we need to open the lids in between to let some air in? What do you say? And this is to... to um about sprouts? Yeah, I think when we were talking about the um, t- uh, leftover containers with the lid on it, um, whether you're doing sprouts or maybe you're just germinating some seeds in it, um, mm-hmm. would you want drainage holes? And then would you want to open the lid every so often to let fresh air in? What do you say? Um, yeah, so for sprouts, you want to like rinse and then drain them. Um and yeah, so I guess what I used to do with my sprouts is yeah. I would rinse them every day and drain them, put them back in the container. And there were holes in the container, but I didn't like open the container up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but like if I were to take 
um, you know, seeds, plant seeds, and then let's say I put them in a plastic bag like this to keep the humidity up. Um, as soon as they germinated, it, they'd be out of this plastic bag mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. just going to cause problems in the future. Yeah, it's really that initial germination phase that you want that really high humidity greenhouse and, effect. And really, you know, go back to what Aaron said, you know, really temperature is huge when it comes to germinating seeds. So a lot of those light systems, you know, even though you don't necessarily always need light for some germinating seeds, it provides heat. True. Mm-hmm. Very true. Did I answer the question, Erin, or did you want to add something? I'm not sure. I yeah, I guess I was I was trying to wrap my head around the drainage hole idea. And I'm not sure you could get small enough drainage holes that the seeds wouldn't fall through. Yeah. So I was trying to like figure that out in my head. So yeah, I with what Kelly said, you know, rinse it and drain it. We want to keep them damp while they're trying to germinate, but then once they start they have germinated and you can see a little tail growing. Um, I would just rinse them, put them back in that container, but maybe leave the lid off so that they can dry out a little bit. Excellent, good points. Okay, well, I think that was our last question. So any, any final thoughts, any kind of leaving points that we wanna leave people with in terms of seed starting? You guys have anything else we didn't get to today maybe that we wanna to touch on quick? I say this all the time, okay? Try it, experiment. Mm -hmm. If you are not successful this year, that does not mean you are a bad gardener. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not a good gardener. It, it could have been other things. Keep trying things. Mm -hmm. You know, you grow tomatoes one year, you're not good at it. It could be what Aaron said. We just had a really bad weather and... The tomatoes didn't do well for anybody. It doesn't mean you're not a good tomato grower. Mm -hmm. Try it again. How many times have Ryan tried yeah. things and been successful? Believe me, Ryan is not successful the first time. <laughs> yeah, amongst the, amongst the four of us, you'd probably be surprised at how many seedlings we have killed over the years. <laughs> it just, it's part of it, yeah. Yeah. So I'd encourage you to, to be experimental and to have fun and not think that one failure means you're not a good gardener. Yeah. And it could be the seeds, like, you know, the yeah. seeds could be bad. Um, so many environmental factors and just keep trying. Like, it's okay. They're just plants. They're just seeds. Just keep, keep trying new things all the time. Yeah. I, I have unsuccessfully grown scallions several times this winter. I've started them and two weeks later, I'm like, there's still nothing there. What's going on? Yeah. Several times. Um, and I think it was just bad seeds at this point because I did it like four times. But <laughs> so I got new new scallion seeds and we'll see what happens with this next batch. But yeah, just don't give up. Just keep trying stuff. Yeah. That's the fun of it, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for being on with us today. That was really awesome. Um, everybody who's watching, I want to thank you for joining. Our next show will be in two weeks. So we're still on that Thursday, um, every two week schedule. And we're going to have another special guest, another Aaron, who is going to talk with us about um, spring ephemerals. So it's going to be about that time where we have all these beautiful wildflowers uh, blooming throughout the state. So we're going to touch on that. And then a couple other reminders. Um, don't forget to check out our um, horticulture Facebook group. We have a University of Illinois Extension horticulture group on Facebook that you can hop into at any time to ask questions, share pictures, and just uh, commiserate with lots of other gardeners um, across the state. Hopefully you enjoyed our intro videos. If you missed those at the start, once we end the live, you can go back and, and watch those. And we're also going to play another video after we say goodbye from one of our colleagues, Chris, about uh, pre-sprouting ginger. So if you're interested in sprouting some other things, stay on and we'll play that video next. So thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your questions. Really appreciate you hopping on and we will see you next time. Happy gardening. Hey folks, Chris here with University of Illinois Extension. And today I want to talk to you about 
pre-sprouting ginger. So ginger is a crop that is growing in popularity here in North America. We're seeing more fruit and vegetable farmers start to grow this, but it is also one that has been a staple in a lot of our diets since we were young. I mean, if you have ever had gingerbread cookies or ginger ale, then this is something that you're familiar with. You know the familiar bite and tang of ginger. It's also something that is very popular in a lot of uh, different types of Asian-based stir-fries and other dishes like that. So ginger is not necessarily something that's new to us, but it is new for us to be growing in this part of the world. What I mean by pre-sprouting is that ginger is a long season tropical crop and in order to give us the most amount of time to be able to grow a, a decent sized harvest from this plant we need to extend this season pretty much by starting the plants inside pre-sprouting them in flats or in containers people will even sprout these in glasses of water well, the first thing that we need in order to get these things pre-sprouted is actual ginger seed pieces and well I just so happen to have a couple right here and I say seed pieces, but these are really the rhizomes, or essentially a modified underground stem, uh, that we use to plant. And each one of these has a small growing point that, after a while of being inside of a potting mix on a, in a flat, it will sprout a new stem, it'll sprout new roots, and that's where we're going to get our ginger plant from. In terms of where you can source your seed pieces, there's a lot of people that will go to the grocery store and they'll buy some ginger root and they will cut it up and they'll place it in a pot and container. Sometimes they'll just place it in a dish of water. You know, you can get sprouting that way. You can get ginger uh, plants that way. We do recommend at Extension that you do order certified disease-free stock. There's not many pests of ginger in North America, but root rot is a big concern. If you get that in your soil, you can't plant ginger in that spot for a long time. And so that means when you buy something in the grocery store, that's made for you to eat, not necessarily for you to grow. There's no guarantee that it's going to sprout into a new plant or that it's going to be disease free. When you get your ginger seed pieces in the mail or you go to the store and you buy them, uh, it it's great if they already come pre-cut and ready to just be put into some container, uh, into some potting soil. Sometimes it's not always true. Maybe you have to make them and cut them into a little bit smaller size pieces. If you do that, make sure you're using a clean knife and it's always a good idea to sterilize between cuts because as I mentioned before, root rot can be a big issue and if you're cutting this uh, root up and you're using the same knife and you're not cleaning it and there just so happens to be a little bit of that pathogen there and it gets on your knife, you can spread it to all of your seed pieces that you are cutting up. Let's say you got your ginger seed piece and it's a little bit too big so you do want to make some cuts. A lot of times there's going to be like a sort of a natural break area where you can snap it. But if you're going to use a knife, again, make sure that you're using a clean knife, you're cleaning it between cuts. What we'll do is you'll just kind of find that natural break point and you'll just cut it with your knife. And it will pretty much just snap right off like this. Now what you want to do is we do not plant this right away. We want to make sure that this wound here has time to callus over and to seal off that spot. Kind of like what we have in this section right here. This is an old cut that they made at the uh, uh, propagators, the uh, seed source that we bought these from. They cut it right here, they broke it off right here, and over time that wound calloused over. It can take anywhere from two to three days for that callous tissue to form and then you are good to plant after that. You know, like right here is a good example of some callus tissue. It's where they made their cut. It's an obvious cut, the straight line right there, and that tissue right there is calloused over. That means no pathogens can get inside of this wound right here. So what we're gonna use for potting these up is we are going to use a soil-free mix. Uh, this is just a, a basic potting mix right here. You can use any type of soil-free mix that you have available to you. Uh, we're going to be using our ginger seed pieces and we're going to be using uh, two flats. This first one that we're actually going to plant them in, this has drainage holes in the bottom of them. Because I'm doing this inside, I don't want water running all over the place. I also have a flat that doesn't have drainage holes in the bottom. And we're going to place the one with holes inside the one that doesn't have holes. You can also pre-sprout ginger in whatever container you intend to be growing it in. So what we have here is just kind of a nice inch, two inch layer of potting mix on the bottom of this flat. And from here, I am just going to start placing our ginger seed pieces on, in the flat, pretty much in rows. It's kind of like putting a puzzle together, however you can fit them all inside of here. When you are putting these in your flat, you do want to be mindful of any type of potential disease issues. So this one right here, the seed piece, it's probably okay, but I feel it's kind of soft 
kind of this has this corky texture to it. And you know what? That soft tissue right there, really spongy. I think I'm going to avoid planting this one just in case there could be any disease possibility or potential lying in this one seed piece. So I'm gonna put this one to the side. Maybe I can put this in a stir fry later instead. And there you have it. Once I have them all in here, I'm gonna kinda give them a little wiggle, kinda embed them down in that potty mix just a little bit. Then once I have these all situated, inside this potting mix in the flat, I'm going to then cover them with a little bit of potting soil. I just barely want to cover the tops, maybe an inch, maybe uh, just barely covering the tops of them. We don't want to be loading too much potting mix on top of them, which might make it more difficult for the pre-sprouting process to occur. And there you have it. This is my flat of ginger. It's ready to go onto the grow bench that I have set up here in my basement. And on what I will be placing it on is a heat mat. So one of the things that ginger needs to have is bottom heat uh, or some type of a warm environment. Remember, this is a tropical crop. My goal for this is to, is to try to hit 80 degrees Fahrenheit in terms of bottom heat. There are some really neat heat mats where you can actually have a thermostat and set your temperature. I don't have that. So what I'm using is just basically a heat mat. The range that I want to try to shoot for, because I don't have any specific control over this, I just have bottom heat, essentially, I want to get in the range of 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means I'll be putting this underneath my flat. I'll be plugging that in, and I'll let this warm up. So in the past, I have used uh, so sort of like hard surface materials. I've used tile, I've used sand to kind of build up and hold some of that heat underneath the flat. It, it's worked for me, but in this case, you know, we don't have any of that. And really for the most part, I think it'll be okay. We're gonna have this heat mat under here, and I'm also gonna be covering this with a layer of plastic. Now, even if you had other flats of ginger, you could stack them on top of each other because really right now it doesn't matter. It's going to take a long time for these seed pieces to sprout. I don't want you to give up if you're trying this at home because it can take anywhere from four to six weeks. I've even had it take up to two months for my ginger seed pieces to sprout. So what you wanna do in the meantime while you're waiting for your ginger pieces to sprout is you wanna make sure that you're keeping this flat evenly watered, letting it dry down a little bit between waterings. Now, not bone dry, but just dry down a little bit. That can also tell, help to initiate growth. You're also gonna to wanna to have your lights set up and ready to go. There is no need to wait until you start to see green growth because once you see green growth, it's almost too late for lights. That stuff needs light immediately, so make sure your grow lights are set up so that you can keep these going inside because more than likely you're gonna to have to wait a few weeks, maybe even a month before you can plant these outdoors. Really the criteria that we use for planting outside is when your soil temperatures hit about 55 degrees Fahrenheit and they're held at that temperature, above that temperature really, for the entire day, which means nighttime temperatures, it doesn't dip below that. About 50 degrees is where these roots and plants will then begin to suffer from cold damage. Uh, if you get down in the 40s and 30s, you would wind up killing these tropical plants. Please feel free, hit that subscribe button. Feel free to get in touch with us. My contact information is down below in the video description. And as always, keep on growing. Thanks for watching.